Well, I, uh, you know, I, I didn't get too close to what was happening because I didn't want to. I was, I, I didn't want to be at loggerheads with Alan, you know, because again, like Francis, I mean, he'd been my close mate, and I, I hated this period where. You know, we were really arguing and Alan's saying to me, you know, I'll come over there, I'll wring your fucking neck, you know. I'm like, this is just, this is just awful. And uh, I don't think anybody likes confrontation like that with, with people you've worked with for, for many years, you know. And uh, I think uh, Alan was uh, very ill-advised uh, by people, uh, whereby he thought that he was going to come out with a few million pounds from... You know, him thinking that he owned part of the name or the name itself and, oh, the legal wrangles over the years. It just rolled on and on and on and dragged its feet on and on. Every So often you'd hear, oh, Lancus has done this and Lancus has done that. Well, he can't do that. Well, he can. He's just done it, you know. And it was just so horrible and all this, this horrible phone calls between us and stuff and... and uh, the case largely sort of fell apart in the end because Alan just had no other doors opening to him, really, and realised that he'd been ill-advised from the start and it cost him a lot of money. And uh, long story short, um, it's all amicable now. Um, you know, we're all chatting away now and it's all... The door's pretty much closed on it now and there's, there's, no, there's no bad feeling anymore. Life's too short for that, you know. I hate it. And I'm so pleased when we last went to Australia to see Alan, you know, who's not in the best of health anymore. I couldn't believe it when I saw him, you know, because Alan's always been fit and tough and really, you know, you you didn't argue with, with Nuff, you know, because he was a he was a he was a tough boy. <coughs> and to see him now, he's uh, he's still lovely. He's he's still very chatty and he's he's uh he makes a lot of sense what he says, and um, I've always liked him, you know. Um, and I'm really pleased that we're we're pals again. And I spoke to him not so long ago, actually, and said uh, um, at the end of the conversation, I said, uh, "Well, when you come over, I said I'm looking forward to seeing you, and uh, we've got a bit of work to do." And it was lovely to say that to to Alan again, you know. We've got a little something to do. Great, so. Let's wait and see what happens. Well, I'm sure Alan wouldn't have seen it that way. I'm sure Alan wouldn't have seen himself as number two because they started the band together um, from school. And I don't think there was any pecking order between them. I'm, I'm sure there wasn't. And if there had been, I'd, Alan wouldn't have accepted uh, the number two. And. Uh, Indeed, when I joined, there was no, there was, there, there was, there was no pecking order. I mean, it was the the four of us, the frantic four, and there was no pecking order. And uh, I've never really, uh, I've never really quite understood it, really, um, why there should be a pecking order. You know, everybody's in there. We all, we all make the decisions, and uh, um, we all say what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. You know. Uh, where the band is concerned, where we're deciding on the stage set and stuff like that. But um, I think, you know, because Francis um, was there right from the start, um, the fact that he wrote Matchstick Men, um, certainly when Alan left, he likes to see himself as number one in the band, and I don't have a problem with that. Okay. We talked earlier about the band reforming with Rhino and Jeff, and obviously there's the In the Army album and the single that came along. But around that time, Def Leppard's drummer had just lost one arm in a bad car crash. Yeah. And Jeff was kind of helping, also sitting in with them <coughs> as well, and yeah. helping them back to full strength. Yeah. How do you work around that factor? Did that become a problem for status quo, or was that something you just knew was going down? No, we knew that Jeff was 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 helping them. And I mean, what a terrible thing to have happened. I mean, you know, if you're in a rock band or whatever you do, really, but particularly if you're in a rock band and you are a drummer and you lose an arm, Jesus Christ. I mean, you, I don't think any of us can begin to imagine how 
that must feel. Um, and Jeff was was very close to them, you know, and he uh, he went in kindly, and we didn't have any issues with it. You know, you go in and help them out and do what you can. Uh, because I'd known Joe from for quite a few years anyway. We'd had a couple of big nights out together, you know, and he lived fairly near me down in Surrey there. And I didn't have any issues whatsoever um, with Jeff going in and, and helping them out. I thought it was the least least he could do, and I thought thought good good of him, you know, to do it. Simple as that, really. Did you want a more detailed answer no, than that? No? That's fine, because Joe's, do Joe's doing the film. Fine. So that'd be cool. I'll get some from Joe as well. Um, Around this time, or just after this time, there's a Top of the Pops appearance without Jeff with Kenny Jones on drums. Yeah, the God. Sky. What, what happened there? <clears throat> Do you know, I don't know. Do you know, I don't know what happened there. And I'd forgotten about that. And I... Um, I don't remember anything about it. <coughs> Kenny, we've obviously interviewed already. Kenny says it was actually you that rung him and said, "Could you? Can we got top of the pops this week, and my drummer is not going to be around." So, well, that's drugs for you. I don't remember a thing about that. I vaguely remember Kenny, did, you know, do it, doing the top of the pops with us. But you know, if you hadn't mentioned it, don't remember. Sorry. <laughs> 